you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for the introduction. It is so great to be back. Um, just wanted to um, really say how excited I am specifically for this um, presentation because everything that you do up to this point, you do the resume, you do the interviews, all of that can boil up to this moment. And that is really navigating these offers and negotiating. So um, I, again, um, we're really going to explore how to understand job offers, negotiate salaries, and decide between multiple opportunities to help you land the best position. I know how to work my presentation. Okay, so as mentioned, um, I am a career coach with over seven years of experience. I'm very passionate about helping individuals navigate this ever-evolving job market and achieve your professional goals. My background does include extensive work with job seekers from diverse backgrounds and really assisting them in developing targeted strategies to help land their dream roles. So some key topics we're going to cover today is one, understanding job offers, then comparing job opportunities and career path options, specifically in the healthcare space. And then we're going to discuss salary negotiating strategies to ensure we understand effective techniques for negotiating a higher salary, better benefits, and, 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 and more along those lines. So let's jump into it. So when we break down a job offer, there's a couple things to look at. First, salary and benefits. So when you negotiate your base salary, bonuses, and any additional monetary compensation, such as signing bonuses or relocation assistance. Health insurance is another major factor. So you can evaluate the healthcare plan options, including coverage, deductibles, co-pays, and prescription drugs coverage. Also retirement plans. Um, really understanding the 401ks, a lot of times they can even match up to 6%, pensions and other investment contributions. A big key one, especially for myself, um, is paid time off or PTO, where you can inquire about the number of paid vacation days, sick days, holidays, and any policies around accruals or even rollovers. Another big factor is a work schedule, especially in healthcare. You need to clarify the expected work hours, overtime policies, and any flexible or remote work options. And as far as career advancement, to me, this is another big one as well, um, because you really want to make sure that in the interviews and in the um, negotiating process that you discuss the potential for professional development, training, upward mobility, further education. So... I know that healthcare job offers can be very complex, but just know it's more than just salary and you need to look at the benefits at a, as a whole and really make sure you know what it is that you're looking for um, in, in your next job. So here are some key things to look for in benefits packages. So you've got coverage types. So there's different types of coverage. You have medical, dental, vision, life insurance to make sure it meets you and maybe even your family's needs. Employer contributions or retirements, um, retirement plans, matching contributions, vesting schedules. You want to make sure you understand this as well, just in case you even want to leave the company. What does that look like to make sure you're secured in the future? And again, that paid time off is huge around the holidays, parental leave. Um, I know some companies will even give you caregiver time off for your kids or a family member. And then of course, those professional development opportunities, maybe even tuition reimbursement, training programs, um, and maybe even management positions in the future. So always be careful to evaluate the coverage types so that way you can make an informed decision and that aligns with your personal and professional goals. So this is really an interesting thing to me because I think a lot of times people think you can just be a doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a PA, or a nurse, but there are so many career opportunities in healthcare. So when deciding between opportunities in healthcare, think about where each role can take you long-term. Are you looking for fast career goals, leadership roles, or patient care focus? For example, career in sales, offers potential for high earnings and client interaction, while research and development positions, positions involve advancing career, advancing healthcare uh, through clinical studies. And then roles like MSLs or medical science liaisons usually bridge pharma and clinical settings. But an MD, DO, PA, NP, medical assistance roles are very patient facing. So if you prefer leadership, maybe even consider management or administration positions in hospital settings as well, or off, our office management. So just know that each path offers a very unique trajectory. So consider how the roles align with your personal and professional 
aspirations. So to really help make a decision, I always like to make a list of my top priorities. For example, you know, um, for me, I know that I really love working with people, but I learned quickly that I love to help people, but I can't necessarily deal with their blood and <laughs> their bodily functions. So I went into pharmaceutical sales so I can help them, but indirectly, which has been really nice as well. Um, so here are some factors to consider for healthcare careers. One is long-term career goals. So you want to evaluate your long-term aspirations and how different healthcare roles can align with your professional de development. Then also desired work-life balance. So considering the work-life balance requirements. So if you want to go be a surgeon or work in an ER, you will be on call. You might work weekends. If you want to be a medical device rep. A lot of times they work weekends. Um, medical science liaison usually works, um, you know, varied hours as well. So just keep that in mind per job you're looking for. And then obviously, like we've always mentioned before, is those opportunities for growth and specializations in the skills and continuous learning that your, are your goals. So one of my favorite topics is the power of negotiating in your career. And this is really where, you know, you have the job offer and you see it and you're like, okay, what do I do next? How do I negotiate this? So this is where we're going to dive into it. So one thing I want you to keep in mind um, is some math. So when you negotiate your salary, an employee who negotiated a starting yearly salary of 55000 rather than fifty, so an extra 5000 would earn an additional 600000 or more over a 40-year career. I can say from personal experience, as well as coaching clients, that by failing to negotiate, you will be leaving money on the table over the course of your career and have to really claw your way to get more money in the future. Negotiating your salary isn't just about the money. It's also about setting the foundation for future raises and benefits. And keep in mind, employers and recruiters expect negotiations and showing your value and showing you value yourself reflects confidence and professionalism. So even if a salary isn't negotiable, there are other areas you can advocate for to improve your overall compensation package, ensuring you're valued from day one. And my biggest piece of advice, if you learn anything from this presentation, is that a closed mouth does not get fed. Negotiating your job offer can have a significant impact on your earnings and also um, help, you know, make sure you bring value to the organization and stay longer as well. So here are some salary ranges in healthcare. So one, first thing I want you to do is understand and research industry st standards. So you need to examine salary data from industry associations, job sites to understand typical pay ranges for healthcare roles. And then also you need to consider location and cost of living. I live in Delaware. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to live here than it is in California. So if I'm ever taking a role in California, I will always negotiate based on the cost of living in that area. Then three, evaluate your years of experience. So a lot of times they'll give you a range, say, hypothetically, between $60,000 and $90,000 for a role. They'll put it on the job posting. Now, if you're one year into you know, your profession, you might be at the bottom of that range. But if you have a lot of years of experience and a lot of achievements and skills, just know you should be at the top of that range. Um, and don't undervalue yourself and don't feel like you can't work your way up that that range of that ladder. And also keep in mind that these recruiters always have a bottom line and they have a top line. It's just like think about real estate. When you go and you put in your offer for a house, it's usually not your best offer. When they go and they give you an offer, it's usually not their best offer either. There's usually more money or more opportunities to negotiate. So also what you need to consider is assessing relevant certifications. So maybe degrees. Also, um, just even being in this course alone is something you can add to your resume to help increase a candidate's earning potential within the healthcare field. So this will really, you know, making sure you understand where they get these ranges from can help make you negotiate better moving forward. So when you're negotiating with a recruiter or a hiring manager, what I always like to do is ask for clarification. So this will help you understand the specific skills, achievements, and impact expected for the higher salary range. So when I go into an interview and I will ask them, hey, what does a $60,000 a year candidate look like versus a $90,000 a year candidate look like? And that way you can get that clarification on what they're looking for um, and really make sure you drive that home. Also, listen carefully. 
If you pay close attention to the recruiter's response, you're taking notes of the skills, achievements, and impact they describe, for that higher salary, you can actually tailor what they're looking for in the interview. <laughs> so you pull their words and you say that in the interview. And that'll be crucial in helping position yourself as the ideal candidate, which leads me to positioning yourself. So throughout the interview, emphasize how your experience and qualifications align with the expectations of that higher range and always demonstrate how you can deliver the same or even greater value to the organization. Here are my key tips that I've used and I've also coached clients to. One, be prepared with data. Research the market rate, gather data on salaries for similar positions, reach out to people that work at the hospital or company or organization and try to understand you know, what their salaries look like as well if they'll share that with you or just going on glassdoor.com will give you a lot of data as well and give you insights into what type of questions they will ask you in the interview. Two, know your value. I, I can tell you from experience that I was told at one point I was only worth $40,000 a year and even less. I don't even think I was salaried at that point. And I told them, I looked at them, I said, I think I'm worth a lot more. And I went and I found a company that would give me 60,000 and knew my worth and plus bonuses and benefits. I didn't settle for the 40. So knowing your value will allow you to walk away from a package that isn't fair to you. Also leverage those non-salary benefits that we discussed before, such as vacation time, retirement contribution, professional development, stock. This will enhance your overall compensation packages. And then making sure you understand the company's policies is really important as well, because you can kind of adjust your expectations based on the policies. The other key thing is timing. You have to choose the right moment to negotiate. Um, when you're receiving a job offer, don't try to talk salary on the first interview, okay? Don't even bring up money. Just wait until you they give you an offer and then negotiate it. Wait till you get the contract in your hand, negotiate it at that point. And when you're in an annual performance review, the worst time to bring up money is when you're in the performance review. You need to be bringing up money a year before. You need to be bringing up that title change a year before. And every single chance you get a follow-up with your manager or performance review or a check-in, you reiterate how important it is to you to get that increase in your salary or the change in your job title. I'm telling you, I don't just go wake up one day at the end of the year, December 2024, and say, hey, manager, I need a raise. No, I'm planting the seeds prior to that. The other thing that I always do, as um, I really want to make clear as well, is when I'm in performance reviews, I always ask my managers, what is it that I need to do in order to make sure I get this award or this raise or this title change in this, um, in, in this section? And they will always tell you exactly what it is that you need to do. You check the boxes on what they're required, and then you do a little bit more than that. And you always operate a couple levels above what's expected of you as well. And that will always bring you more money. Now, when you're in the process and they ask you, you know, what are your salary expectations? They might even ask you this on the first call. So one, it's important to do your research, like we discussed before on the skills needed, location, um, experience, and then provide a range. So here's how I kind of get around it. Um, you know, you can either ask them another question or you can say, based on my research and experience or other offers, I'm seeking a salary ranging from X to Y. Okay, and, and really make it your bottom line and then make it your top as well. So really give them a realistic range that you're willing to go with and also based on your research and your experience and maybe what your current salary is or like I said, another offer. Stay flexible. Don't give them any you know, non-negotiables or ultimatums. Stay very flexible as well with the benefits and even bonuses. But by following these steps, You'll make sure you can confidently navigate the salary negotiation process and present a compelling case for your value as a candidate. Here are some phrases to avoid in salary negotiations. My biggest thing, and I didn't even put it down here, I'm just going to say this right now, is saying, I think. That's not confident. Say, I know or I'm confident that. And that way you can, again, show that confidence. The other one is, I'm okay with whatever you think is fair. Nah, 
This will make you seem passive and may lead to an offer below your expectations. The second or third one in this case is I need this amount because of my personal expenses. I have bills, I have kids. Do not discuss personal financial needs or hardships. Hardships in the negotiation, just focus on what it is you can do and make it relevant. And then another thing to avoid is I haven't done much research on salaries. Just don't say that, do your research. And the other phrase is, this is my final offer. This is my final, this is my final amount. Don't give them ultimatums and definitely don't do this prematurely. It can shut down the negotiation process. And this last one is huge. And I will say from experience, I have said this because I got so excited. I got the offer. It was fresh out of college, wasn't working in a great environment, really wanted out. And this was my dream job that I got the offer for. And I was like, thank you. This sounds great. I accept. And then I hung up the phone. And I was like, why did I say that? <laughs> I didn't even try to negotiate. So just know once they give you that initial offer, it shows they want you. So take advantage, the ball's in your court <laughs> and you can negotiate. And the worst thing they can do is say no. But my biggest thing is just turn your poker face on, say thank you so much for the offer. Can you please send over the contract so I can review it and get back to you in 24 hours <laughs> and ask for that contract, review it. And that is expected as well. Just stay cool, calm and collected, unlike how I was. <laughs> So by avoiding these phrases, um, you will make sure that you remain open to further discussion and also you have a more successful salary negotiation. This is a really great story about a client that I actually had that was able to negotiate her salary. So this was the process. Um, the client came to me and was like, listen, I, I need like $20,000 more from my current company. And I was like, okay, here's a couple of things we can do. So first we revamped her resume to show impact, not responsibility. And when sharing impact, we added quantifiable numbers, including dollar signs, percentage, number of people about process improvements, money she generated and managed, people she supervised, time she saved by enhancing processes um, and softwares that she's either implemented or improved. Then, um, what we did was we got the whole resume revamped and we got it in the hands of a recruiter at another company. Keep in mind, she wasn't really happy with the pay she had at her current company. And it was important for her to know her worth on the street. So the recruiter gave her resume one look and immediately knew he could get her the salary she requested just based on the resume, power of the resume. Then after getting the job offer from this other company, she used it as leverage with her current company. She created and presented a pitch deck to her current managers and C-level executives. The deck included the impact she had made, the software she knew that no one else knew, her MBA education, and salary research based on her years of experience and education. Now, unfortunately for the current company, she now knows that she is worth more than what they're offering her. And there's another company willing to give her what she deserves. She made sure to tell her current employers that she loved her position. She felt passionate about the mission. She enjoys the company culture and can see herself growing here. But she just really needed them to meet, meet her where, they, where she wanted them to be, which was an additional $20,000. Well, after leveraging that other job offer, presenting her case, they did give her an increase of $20,000. This was huge for her and it was allowing her to stay at the company. So keep in mind, you can't expect they give you this salary because you feel you deserve it. That's what entitlement is. That will come across that way every single time. So instead of being entitled, you need to show them by doing your research, identifying your value on the street and putting in the work and be prepared. They might say no, and that's maybe because they don't value you. And just keep in mind, like they might let you go, <laughs> but that's okay. Go where you are valued. Just be prepared for any outcome when you do this. Um, if you say you want to leave, they might let you. Okay. So just keep that in mind um, when you're doing this strategically. So when you're deciding between multiple offers, there's a couple things to look at. One is salary and benefits. So you wanna compare the base salaries, bonus potential, retirements, healthcare coverage, very similar to what we talked about before. 
But what we haven't talked about is the company culture. If this is important to you, this is very crucial for you to assess the work environment, management style, work-life balance, and overall employee satisfaction to ensure, ensure that company culture aligns with your preferences. Then again, long-term growth. You have to evaluate the company's growth trajectory, opportunities for advancement, and potential for you to develop new skills and take on more responsibility over time. And the other key factor to make sure you reflect on before deciding between multiple offers is alignment with your own values. So reflect on your personal goals and priorities and choose the offer that best enables you to pursue work that is meaningful and fulfilling. And I know as healthcare professionals, you're doing that every day. So when you have multiple offers, it's not sometimes just about money. You need to consider all these factors right here and then think about where you see yourself thriving in the long term and how it aligns with your personal values. So ultimately, you need to prioritize what is most important to you. If you need to decline an offer, do so politely and professionally. It's always good to leave the door open for future opportunities. And when deciding between opportunities in healthcare, think about where each role can take you long term. So to help make a decision, I like to make a list of my top priorities. For example, my number one is work-life balance, two advancement opportunities, three pay, four culture. So I'm gonna go with the company that aligns best with those factors. For example, there is a company out there that will pay me far more, but they won't give me the work balance that I have right now. And to me, that work balance is priceless. <laughs> so that's my priority. Also, I love the culture of my current company and the culture is very different at the other company. So I'm gonna stay put. So just make sure that you're always out like weighing the pros and cons, do a list, um, and just make sure you're always prioritizing your needs. So this is a story, um, a personal one actually, um, about a time where I had to decide what to do when I had an offer from my dream company, but I had an offer from another job that I did not accept yet. But here's how it went down. And here's a couple things to remember. So first of all, I want you to remember to consider yourself lucky that you have multiple options because this might happen for some of you, especially in this job market. It's a very tough one. So there are gonna be a few different options here when you're stuck in this sticky situation. So one is you stick with the first company to showcase integrity and make sure you don't burn a bridge. But the downside here is that you miss out on the opportunity you've always wanted because company A isn't necessarily where you wanted to be, okay? And then the other out, other way to handle this is confirm the offer with the dream job. So company B, right? And get it in writing, okay? Then go to the other company and let them know you were not anticipating another opportunity, but you appreciate their time. Downside here is you burn a bridge, but at least you get a shot at your dream job. If you're waiting on a job offer from a dream company or job, what you can do is use the power of negotiating to buy you time from company A, from the company you're not that excited about, and you can negotiate back and forth for up to about a week, and that will buy you time that you need to get the written offer from company B, your dream job, or pursue the interview process further. Story time here, seven years ago, I was in this position. I had a job offer to sell printers with Conoco Minolta. I don't like printers. I do not want to sell them. I think they're built to break, not my thing. Um, well, a few days after receiving that job offer with Conic Minolta, I received an opportunity to interview as a pharmaceutical sales rep working for my dream company. Now, keep in mind, pharmaceutical sales was my goal, but I was told by a recruiter that I had to sell printers first. So take this opportunity. Well, while I was waiting for a potential offer to come through from my dream pharma company, I was buying time with Conconalta by negotiating my offer with them. Now, fast forward, I am still working for my dream company, my dream job, and in the industry I wanted. But had I not put my needs first that day, I would have settled for a job I never wanted just to make sure I didn't disappoint anyone. Now, at the end of the day, I, I honestly would have let myself down and that would have been far worse. Now, like I said, I wouldn't advise you burn a bridge. I didn't like I you just have to be careful of that. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure your dreams and goals go above 
anything else. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're kind of navigating all these job offers and, and really try to balance that negotiating tactic. But again, go with your gut. I did that. I'm so happy, but I almost went back to my people pleasing tendencies and signed that all for selling printers, but instead use the time to get myself the other offer with the other company. Now, here are some additional resources that I want you all to leverage. So one is um, salary benchmarking websites. So like Glassdoor, Payscale, Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, two, negotiation books and podcasts. So if you like to read, go to books. If you like to listen, podcasts are amazing. Um, and they can give you a lot of effective strategies. Um, Negotiations Ninja is great. Or if you wanna follow me on Instagram, TikTok, I always give advice there as well. And then industry association. So I want you to start connecting with professional organizations to access networking opportunities, industry insights and more um, negotiation support. So um, thank you so much for joining me. But before we wrap up, let's just quickly recap what we covered today. We talked about how to fully understand a healthcare job offer from salary and benefits to career advancement opportunities. We explored key salary negotiating strategies to help you secure the best possible package. And we discussed how to compare different job offers to make the right decision for your career. Remember, each offer is more than just a paycheck. It's the whole package and how it aligns with your values and long-term goals. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope these tips help you navigate your next offer with confidence. Um, now I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was very helpful. And I love what you said about really considering company culture, because a lot of times that is not as prioritized as we want to. And I like to think of it as, would you like to make six figures with, to your point, no work-life balance and you're working around the clock versus getting that peace of mind, even though the salary is not quite up to where you want it to be. So thank you for really highlighting that. I also want to share with our attendees that we do have a career website if you're interested in support with updating your resume or are you looking for jobs, I will post that in the chat for you to take a look at. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for folks to digest the information and start uploading their questions, you talked about benefits and not really bringing that up at the first interview. What are your recommendations? At what point should you start having those conversations? Because sometimes what you see online might not give you that full view of what the company has to offer, but when is the right time to start having those conversations about benefits? Is it before you get an offer, when you get the contract to review? What are your tips on that? Yeah, I mean, as far as, um, if it doesn't have anything to do with the dollar amount, right? I think it's fair game to really have those conversations even with the recruiter. A lot of times they'll proactively bring it up, which will be amazing for you. Um, but as far as any of those details, my biggest key thing is I reach out to employees that work there. And that way you're getting very accurate, real-time information. And you don't even have to go to a recruiter or a hiring manager about it. Because I also want you to keep in mind that you have a limited time in these interviews and interactions. And if you want to spend your time talking about the benefits, ask one question and, and make that your very strong question. Um, you can even ask the hiring manager, you know, what is what is one of your favorite, you know, benefits that, you know, you get to exercise at this company that they provide, right? And get them to talk about it and ask in that way. And that way it's more about them. It's less like self-serving and kind of like around, um, you know, jumping around that topic. But, um, you know, I would even wait toward for the contract to come if it's not going to be a big factor, so if this is a dream company for you, then you, know, you can wait for the contract to come out. And I'm sure it'll be fair. But if maybe it's a company you don't know much about and you're like, it might even be a scam company for all I know, feel free to get that information a little bit sooner, um, maybe even in like the third interview towards the end. Um, but again, if it's not a deciding factor, I would just hold off on those questions and discuss that later once mm -hmm. you get the contract. Thank you, Lindsay. We do have a few questions coming in and one asks, um, what would negotiating PTO look like? Yes. So for negotiating PTO, a lot of times that can even look 
a little different per company. So PTO can even be, hey, listen, you know, I need 20 extra hours a week of PTO or PTO could even be a little more flexible nowadays where it's like, listen, I want some work from home opportunities. And that can be a big key differentiator too. Um, so I would do that. Now, some companies will not wiggle on the PTO. They're like, listen, every other employee here has 18 days paid time off. That's what you get. So if they're not going to negotiate PTO with you, that's okay. Try to negotiate something else. Um, but that, that can be a tough one to negotiate, but I would always go for an extra, like, you know, couple days, start small a week. The other way to negotiate this actually too, is if you're currently getting 30 days paid time off a year at your current company and they, this new company really wants you be like, listen, I currently get 30, you're offering 25 days a year. Can, can we get an extra five and I'm coming, right? If that's that important to you, I would mention it. Um, cause again, it's all about the work-life balance. So that's another way to leverage it is say, listen, this other company that gives me the offer, the current company I'm working with is offering 30. How can we match that? And negotiate it the same way you negotiate a salary. You know, how can we get closer to that number is something I always like to say as well. Thank you. When you talk about um, sort of sharing external offers that you might have with your current employer, I know that could be very sticky and you offered some tips, but how would conversations like that with your manager go where you are being respectful in, in sharing that this is what you have external and how can you match that so you don't burn bridges, if anything? Wait, I'm sorry. You broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that question? Sorry. Oh, no worries. I'm sorry. Um, So you talk about sort of um comparing and sharing any external offers that you could get with your current company. And those conversations sometimes can be very sticky and hopefully it doesn't lead to retaliation and then sort of kicking you out of the company. But beyond the tips you shared, what would that conversation look like? So you're not burning bridges and leaving yourself vulnerable to potentially losing your job. Yeah. What I always like to do is, um, you know, you don't even have to say it's from another company. Okay. So if you got another offer for 20 grand more, don't go to your current employer and say, I got another offer for 20 grand more, you know, rub it in their face. Just be like, Hey, listen, you know, uh, my goal would be, you know, to get $20,000 more this year. Here's all of the achievements. Here's what I've done. And you write it out and you make it very action oriented and results oriented. And then if they say no, right. And they're like, I can't even give you 10 cents more. Then you got to re you know, reevaluate that. But if they're like, Hey, listen, yeah, I can get you $10,000 more. Okay, then you know they're open for negotiating and you can work from there. And if you're still not satisfied, then what I want you to do is go to the employer and go, you know, and pitch them. Like literally just like that story I shared, like write up a whole pitch deck and present your case as to why you deserve that extra $20,000 and be like, listen, I really want to stay here. I'm happy here. But I just, based on everything that I've achieved, based on my skills, based on my experience, based on my research... I truly believe I'm worth, you know, $20,000 extra and, you know, put the number down and here's the value I bring to you. And you can say, listen, you know, I do have another offer. Like the last thing I want to do is leave this company, but this is something that is weighing on me now. You know, what can we do to get closer to get me to stay? And, you know, sometimes they'll negotiate with you and I've negotiated like dollars, right. To the point where it was like a couple dollars, um, an hourly. Um, and I had to fight for that. And then there's other moments where you're negotiating $20,000, but it's all the same, no matter how much you're negotiating, you're advocating for yourself. And if you have to pull that, Hey, listen, I have another offer card by all means, but just always like read the room. You know, if you think they don't like you and they're not really a great manager, that's going to advocate for you, that, that might not work. But if you have a really great manager and you know, they value you and they know they like you and you've been there for a while and you haven't asked for much, you, you go for it. Right. So just always read the room. It's situation by situation and truly like reflect and think, what is it that I have done? Have I really made an impact? Am I operating at a higher level than what's expected of me? So if you're just a, you know, regular level S1, let's call it, are you operating in an S3 level, an S4 level? Every single time I've ever asked for a raise or a promotion, it's not because I'm operating at my level. It's because I've mastered my level already. And I'm always operating two, three levels above what's expected of me without them even asking. 
The other good question to ask yourself is, have I made their lives easier as managers? Okay. And if you have, then you have a better shot of negotiating that. So those are some things and conversations to have. But again, read the room because there are some managers out there that do not want to see their people succeed. And there's other managers out there that do. And there's companies that do have a pocket for this. And if they don't give you money, try to negotiate stock options. Try to negotiate more paid time off. Negotiate something. They got to give you something if they value you. And if they don't, which I've been in this position, you leave and you'll be okay. Just always use that other offer and bring it up if you're serious about leaving as well. If you're like, yeah, no problem leaving this company. You can always bring it up. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We have a good question here about working with employment agencies. How do you negotiate with them when they usually don't have any wiggle room with pay increases or they're a lot of times paying that minimum wage, if not lower. So what are your suggestions there? Yeah, with these agencies, I've dealt with this. Actually, it was, it was that company when I was fresh out of college and um, there was no negotiating. So what I did was, you know, I didn't have any other options, really. Um, I took the job offer and I negotiated later. I negotiated at the six month mark. And I started to get, like letting them know throughout, you know, after four months, you know, and seeing what kind of achievements I've done and impact. At this point, you know, you're doing, if you're doing like three jobs for the price of one, then negotiate at the six month mark, right? They're giving you way more responsibilities than what was outlined in the job posting, negotiate. I would always start having that conversation at the six month mark. So at least by a year, they're gonna do something within that range, six months to a year, but I wouldn't wait. If you weren't happy with the original offer, don't take it and don't settle or take it and start negotiating within six months and make a big impact um, you know, and then start negotiating within six months to a year. But um, unless your back's against the wall, I, I wouldn't take an offer where I wasn't valued or it wasn't up to par at this point. Don't settle. Now, if you can learn something from the company and there's some other factors other than pay, then go ahead and take it. But again, there's so many factors that go into that. But if you can't negotiate it with them and that's your only offer and, you know, there's some perks to the company, then take it. Um, but a lot of times they just don't have wiggle room and they're not lying. But some of these recruiters are like, yeah, you know, we don't have wiggle room. And that's not true. <laughs> Majority of the time, it's just not true. So always try to really get the truth out of them and talk to, again, current employees or people that have been employed under their, you know, watch. Thank you. Um, another question here asks, um, from your experience, what would um, being a PA or medical doctor or MD, what would growth look like in a company and what would you negotiate? Mm. Okay, this is interesting. So um, I see medical assistants every day trying to negotiate pennies on the dollar or like a $2 an hour um, or $2. It's they're, they're not fighting for much. Um, and what I've honestly seen is a lot of these medical assistants have a hard time getting promotions at certain companies, um, mostly because they think you're replaceable. But I will tell you, there is a medical assistant. Um, this was interesting. She started as an MA. And then she kept getting promotions. She kind of kept advocating for herself and working her way up at a very, very big dermatology practice that's like all over the East Coast. And then um, worked her way up as an office manager. So to your question, office manager could be next and supervising the MAs and the doctors. Then she actually was able to move on to being a regional manager for every office. And she gets paid a lot more money. She's managing all the MAs, you know, the staffing, logistics, scheduling, you know, a lot of things, but um, she's getting paid more and she's getting, you know, honestly, more, more respect um, than she was getting even as an MA at that current company. So those are some areas of opportunity is office manager. Then the other thing too, is they have um, positions called like biologic coordinators um, where you are handling prior authorizations at a, um, an office. So you're more than just an MA, you're dealing with insurance companies, making sure patients get coverage. And then from there, again, you can graduate to being an office manager. Um, and as you get more responsibility, they will end up paying you more. But as a medical assistant, it depends on the company. But from what I've seen, it's very difficult to get raises or get them to see your value um, in, in most cases. Uh, but again, don't feel like you can't advocate. Have your manager or boss go back to the main company and negotiate for you. 
always ask the worst thing they can do. They'll just say no. And you'll say, okay. Right. And then you go online and you apply to some other jobs. Um, that, that's how I would handle it. But there is upward mobility there. Now, the other thing is if you're like an MD, DO, and you know, those types of positions, they become chief medical officers of the entire hospital. So if you're looking to get into management positions, that's what you can do. Also nurses, the way they progress is they become managers of the entire unit in the hospital. So you have like a dialysis unit with 20 nurses. Next thing you know, they're managing the nurses. And I will tell you that those managers, as they get older, are a lot happier. Because maybe when you're in your 20s or 30s, you can be on your feet a lot, use your hands, and, and you'll be fine with that, and syringes. But you'll, you might get tired of that. So if you stay on that track and you become a manager of a unit, you get paid a lot more money and it's a lot less labor. <laughs> um, so that can always help um, as well. I hope that kind of answered all of your questions in any facet, depending on your, um, you know, your background. Thank you, Lindsay. Another question here asks, if you give a salary range and they come back with an offer that's lower, that's at the lower end of your range, um, would you suggest negotiating even if you take the offer? So if you took the offer, okay. So what I would always do is if they came in under the range that you were looking for, I would, I would negotiate that. Um, abs absolutely. Um, and like I said, go with your case, say, listen, what, you know, here's why, uh, here's what I've done for previous companies. Here's my experience. Um, you know, that bottom range is for somebody that has zero to one ex years of experience. I have five years of experience. So how can we get more to the middle of this range? And um, that is the, probably one of the better ways to negotiate that up is you're here, you're at the bottom, but like, you know, that that just isn't really where you need to be. Also, you can say, listen, I'm currently making more than that. <laughs> I'm not going to leave my company for less or for the equivalent that I'm making now. And that's how you can negotiate that as well. But like I said, I wouldn't take an offer and get excited and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then backtrack. That's a very difficult to get out of that hole once you kind of showed your face and not had that poker face. Um, so I would do my very best to negotiate the second you get the offer, take your time, you know, look it over, send it to friends, send it to me, send it to, you know, people that you trust, family to help um, review that contract. And then go back to them in a very confident, calm, cool, collected way and negotiate that contract. But I think if once you once you accept it, you're kind of you're kind of stuck, like I said, at least for another six months. Thank you, Lindsay. And one last question here. Um, this is more from personal experience. And this um, attendee is asking, what would you say if you're going through employment through an employment agency and they have a job offer, but it's with three weeks of training? Is that a red flag from your experience? It's with three weeks of training. So you need to train before taking the offer? I think the offer comes with three weeks. I guess the onboarding part of it is three weeks of training. And this this participant is asking, is should that should she consider that a red flag? No. Um, I think that training is fine. I mean, as long as they're paying you. <laughs> I'd hope they're paying you. Um, if you're not, they're not, that's that's interesting. Um I have seen that before. It just depends on, you know, if you can go three weeks without pay, if it's worth it. But if my personal philosophy is I wouldn't want to work for a company that's not paying me for three weeks to do a job that they're making me do. If it's like, you know, Intel that only they can train me to do, then I, I wouldn't want to work for a company that would pay me and train, you know, they're making me train and they're not paying me. I, I would see that as a, as a red flag. Um, go find a company that, is going to pay you for the three weeks while they train you. Um, it's part of their investment. Let me put it this way. It is their responsibility and part of their overhead to pay you while they train you. But if they're going to pay you and train you, that's not a red flag at all. They just want to make sure you know what you're doing before they let you loose. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I don't see any additional questions in the chat or Q&A. So I just want to thank you so much again for your time, a wealth of information that you've shared, and I hope our participants found this session um, valuable to them. Again, a recording of this will be available within the next hour or so. And I've also posted a link to our on-demand site so you can take a look at this presentation and any past webinars if you'd like. 
So with that, I'd like to wish you all a very good weekend and hope to see you again soon. And thanks so much, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.